If you would, uh, turn over to the book of Haggai. <clears throat> Hey guys, kind of unusual in the the uh, the fact that it was just a, almost a single topic uh, book, and that topic was to build the uh, temple. Of course, I gave a lesson on this that dealt with that, and I wanted to uh, complete that reading of that that I interrupted by the expiration of time last Wednesday night. But before we begin that, uh, let's have a, just a short prayer. Would you bear, bear with me, please? Heavenly Father, we are indeed a blessed people to be able to dwell upon Thy Word that Thou hast left for us to guide us to, through this life that we may attain the life to come. And we pray that will continue to bless us with our word, and we're grateful for these writers of old that they have penned these things that we may have the benefit of the wisdom that was left before us. We pray now that they will bless our study and bless us in all things through Christ Jesus our Lord. In His name we pray. Amen. Of course, we know from reading the uh, um, Old Testament that Nehemiah primarily dealt with building the the wall. Of course, they had opposition from that. And then uh, Ezra primarily dealt with the building the, the temple. And they met opposition there, and of course there was a period of about 16 years in which they ceased uh, on the construction of the temple. And that's partly because of the opposition, and maybe it was just a difficult task. But we read last time where um, about King Artaxerxes and so forth, and Darius, the uh, king, and we stopped off in, in Ezra, the fifth chapter, verses one and two. <clears throat> said then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, and of course when we get when we get to Zechariah, we'll dwell somewhat there on the uh, rebuilding of the temple also. But Haggai, that's that's all it's about. Uh, prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Hedo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem. Of course, Haggai and, and Zechariah are contemporaries of each other. Uh, they, they prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem, the name of God of Israel, who was over them. So, so uh, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Zodah, Joseph Dak rose up and began to build the house of God which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with him, helping them. So in Zechariah, which we're going to get to after Haggai, in the fourth chapter, verse 6 and 7, so he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you should become a plain. So he's just saying that if the God has uh, authorized it, it doesn't matter what the obstacle is. And that's a good lesson for us today that as long as we are doing the will of our Father in heaven, there's no obstacle that can prevent us from doing it. 
Will we meet obstacles? Well, of course we will. But there be as uh, mountains were to as rubble, they were nothing. When the word, uh, when there's a work commissioned by God and performed in a manner approved by God, it doesn't matter what the task is. If it's a very noble task or a very small task, if it's commissioned by God and you're doing it, even if it is the mountain, it's still going to become uh, an easy task to uh, overcome, to accomplish. It's been said in Ezra that the, the uh, foundation of the temple was laid. And there are a lot of people that were saddened by the extent of the construction that it was not it was apparently it was not going to be as glorious as the temple of Solomon that was destroyed and they were uh, upset about that but again if it's a work commissioned by God there's no such thing as it not being a glorious work so whether the temple was too small for some it was enough for the Lord. He commissioned it, so it was enough. And so we all get into Zechariah later, and he'll talk about the uh, the small things. You know, I had a lesson on small things. That it, again, if if the uh, Lord has commissioned it, then it is no small thing. So that's where we uh, get to Haggai that the work had ceased for a period of 16 years. And it says in the uh, second year of the King Darius, and, and Darius came, became king in 522 B.C. And so that meant that they uh, Haggai started his prophecy in 520 B.C., two years afterwards. So in the second year of King Darius, uh, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, and you'll notice this throughout the book of Haggai, I think um, it occurs about, or some variation of it, it occurs about 28 times, or, or something like that. Good many times. There's only 28 verses in Haggai, so it occurs quite often. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts. So we know from that where this message is coming from saying this people says, and it usually uh, Jehovah, the Lord would say, my people. But he doesn't hear. He says, this people. So, uh, you know, you gather from that that he wasn't pleased with this people. He didn't call them my people. This uh, people says, this is what the people are saying, this, the time has not come but the time that the Lord's house should be built. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Now, if you look back over history, you know that it was prophesied that the uh, Jews would be in captivity for 70 years. And if you go from the time that the first captives were taken to, to Babylon, is 605... 606 B.C. Depends how you count the years. So, 70 years from that is what, 536 B.C.? That's 70 years. Is that right? I got my math right? Okay, got my math right. 536. <clears throat> and that's when they returned to Jerusalem. They, and they started building the, uh, the, you know, the wall and built the... Uh, started the foundation of the temple and then they ceased for 16 years so that gets you down to 520 but 
the temple was destroyed in 586 BC. So if you count down 70 years from 586, that's uh, 516, 516. And Haggai is prophesying 520. So the people may have said, well, you know, it hadn't been 70 years yet. <laughs> so so we, we don't have to build a temple. But I think they were making excuses. Obviously they were because uh, here, you know, through uh, Haggai, God is getting on their case. <clears throat> anyway, in verse uh, 3, it says, And the word of the Lord came by Haggai. And we'll see that quite often. The word of the Lord, this speaks to the Lord. That sort of uh, phraseology came by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? It kind of gives you an idea of where their priorities lay. They had time, and, and who knows what materials they used, where they got the materials, but they had time to build their own houses, and they're very fine houses. They're paneled, <coughs> you know. Back then, if you had a panel house, it was it was a nice house. So, he said, it is time for you to be a, to dwell in your panel houses in this temple to lie in the waste. Therefore, thus says the Lord. We see that quite often. Thus says the Lord. Message coming from Him. Consider your ways. And you know, we'd probably say, you know, you need to take a good look at yourself. Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put in a bag with holes. Now, Sowing much and not uh, uh, bringing anything means crop, crops didn't make. And you eat, don't, don't have enough, uh, you're not filled, means not enough food there to, to assuage the hunger. And you drink, but you're not filled with drink, the uh, grapes are not making. There's no fruit of the grapes. And you clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. You know, they get their uh, clothing from the wool and so forth. And the uh, sheep are not producing. So they don't have enough clothes. And and I, uh, I think it gets pretty cold there in the winter. And you earn wages to put in a bag with holes. Well, that doesn't mean that the moths had eaten the holes in the bag. But... Think about it a moment. Economics. Think about economics. <clears throat> you don't have any food. You don't have any drink. Very little of it. You don't have any clothes. Very little of it. <clears throat> what happens to the price? It goes up. You have inflation. So they're earning money, but inflation is taking it all. So they're, they're putting... Uh, is this is as if they're putting their wages uh, in a bag with holes? <clears throat> Somebody else doing that? <laughs> Who is that? We got there's a lot of bags with holes in them these days. But anyway, they didn't have any blessings because they had failed to do what they were obligated to do was to rebuild the temple, and they did have opposition. But again. If it's a task that's uh, commissioned by God, then it's a task that needs to be completed. Again, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. He prefaced it with consider your ways, then said they have no blessings, and he's saying again, Consider your ways. He said, go up to the mountains, and that's probably the, the mountains of uh, Lebanon. Uh, you know, you talk, talk about the cedars of Lebanon. That's probably the mountains he's talking about. And bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Now, now the reason that the uh, temple was important 
to the uh, people of uh, Jerusalem or the Jews is because that's, that's where God said He would dwell in the temple. He's still dwelling in the temple, but it's a heavenly temple. He's always, always just had one temple, really. But for the um, survival of the nation, they needed the temple. So it's very important that they uh, rebuild this temple. But he says, build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. That was where they would uh, glorify the Lord. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. And they may, they may have never realized that the reason didn't have anything is because they weren't fulfilling their, their obligation that had been uh, uh, given to them to build the temple. They may, they may not have ever realized that. They may not have connected the two, but uh, they are now, Haggai is telling them. You look for much, but indeed, in verse 9, uh, but indeed, it comes to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. They may have ascribed it to other reasons that it went away, but the Lord here is saying He blew it away. Why, says the Lord, why did these things get blown away? Because of my house that is in ruins. And every one of you runs to his own house. They took care of their own things, but neglected the things of the Lord. Again, that's a good lesson for us today. Let's not neglect the things of the Lord uh, while taking care of our own things. Take care of both of them. Therefore, in verse 10, Therefore the heavens above you will withhold the dew, and the earth withhold its, uh, its uh, fruit. Now, I understand in desert climates that the dew is very important because a lot of times the moisture... Uh, the dew that collects on the plants, they absorb that, and that's where they get their water. I was reading something uh, the other day about the uh, Atacama Desert in northern Chile, or Chile as they would call it, that it's the driest place on the year. There's no measurable rainfall prior to 2018 for 500 years. But they had uh, bountiful rainfall in 2018, of course it's global warming, you understand, global warming. But it, apparently there were bacteria in the soil that survived very well in a desert climate. But when the these rains came in 2018, it formed puddles and what have you, it killed all the bacteria because they couldn't take that much water. But the way that the plants, the way they did get water was the dew that would settle in the uh, desert. Very little, but it was all they needed. So dew was very important. Uh, I don't think probably it was global warming back at this time, but maybe. But anyway, the earth withholds its fruit. And they may have ascribed it to other things. I'm sure they did. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains on the grain and the new wine and the oil. And those were all very important commodities in that time. On whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. Everything suffered as a result of their neglect of rebuilding the temple and the uh, punishment that God imposed upon them for that lack. Verse 12, then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the uh, remnants of the people. And again, keep in mind that the Lord never said that all the Jews would return to uh, Jerusalem, but only a remnant. And we'll read about uh, remnants later down in verse uh, chapter 2. With all the remnants of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, and the word of Haggai, the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. So even though Haggai 
maybe was not as a stern you know, a prophet as uh, Amos or as a poetic one as uh, Baca. He, he's more you know, what we'd call prosaic. He, he just told it like it is. He's more of a prosaic, prosaic uh, writer than uh, either of those two. But he was the right prophet for the job. Because when he delivered the message, again, he ascribed it to the Lord because we see this over and over again that uh, the uh, Lord speaks or the Lord said this. But they started, they listened to it, they heeded it, and they started the work on the temple. And maybe they needed some encouragement. said, uh, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, and that's the first time that uh, a prophet is called a messenger, but really a, a prophet speaks what he has been commanded to speak. Sometimes it's events in the future. Sometimes it's just a message. And that's why Haggai is called the Lord's messenger. Then Haggai spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So, Again, that's a comfort to us that as long as we comply with the wishes of our Heavenly Father, He's with us. In spite of all the hardships we may suffer, He's with us. And we should take great comfort when He tells us, I am with you, says the Lord. For verse 14, So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And of course, keep in mind that uh, Zerubbabel was the governor and, and uh, uh, Joshua was the high priest. Those are the ones that should be been instrumental in getting the people to work. They should not have needed the uh, additional impetus that came from Haggab, but nevertheless they did, and but they, but they got to work. Uh, again, it talks uh, about the remnant. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua. And uh, the spirit of all the remnant of the people, again, the remnant, those that came back. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. Uh, in the third year, and only about three, three and a half weeks after uh, Haggai uh, began uh, delivering them the message from the Lord. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, and of uh, son of uh, Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its for former glory? And uh, the temple was destroyed in 586, and this is 520, so that's 66 years. It very well could have been some people still living, and apparently there was or he wouldn't have mentioned it. Uh, and where was I? Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes as nothing? And, and some of them certainly thought it was uh, less glorious than Solomon's temple. But he's saying here, don't consider it less glorious. I've commissioned this. That in itself makes it glorious. That in itself makes it uh, something. Don't judge this according to human uh, perceptions. That'd be a wrong way of doing it. Verse 4 it says, now, Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. And be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, 
high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. Remember, he told them as long as they were faithful to him, he would uh, bless them. <clears throat> so my spirit remains among you, do not fear. And he, he said in, uh, when they came out of Egypt that as long as you remain faithful, I'll be your God. For thus, in verse 6, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, and he'll use that terminology again later on, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Now, not real sure what the desire of all nations is. King James uses that, but the American Standard uses uh, the uh, uh, prize things or the uh, precious things of the uh, nations and which one is uh, probably the, the, the most accurate maybe the American standard but he certainly there's certainly going to come a time where all nations are going to be shaken all the uh, um, Gentile nations they're going to be shaken and they shall come with their precious things. So, uh, exactly what are those precious things? It could be the things that are going to be used to build the temple. It could be themselves. Uh, it says in verse uh, 8, The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. So it, it could be that that silver and gold is going to come from these nations, or it could be that the returning Jews, whatever gold and silver they have, they'll contribute it. But anyway, the fact of the matter is, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former. So this temple is going to be greater than the temple of Solomon. And if he is, is referring to the spiritual temple, of course it's going to be more glorious than the uh, physical temples. And in this place I will give peace as the Lord of, of hosts. What, what place is that? And we know that certainly that the uh, uh, this temple and the, the expansion of it done by Herod, Herod's temple is going to be destroyed. But this, if it's a spiritual temple, it's never going to be destroyed. And there's going to be peace there. I'll give peace as the Lord of hosts. On the, uh, on the, well, we better stop there since that's a break. That the, uh, it's going to talk about later, talk about the disobedient of the, the remnant. So in verse 10, we'll start verse 10 in the uh, next Wednesday night. Thank you for your attendance.